Hello Blazers, welcome to episode 116 of UAB Green and Told. Original release, Monday, January 29th, 2024. Our podcast allows us the opportunity to share stories from members of the UAB community. Check out all of our previous episodes by visiting alumni.uab.edu slash greenandtold on Spotify or the Apple Podcast app. And while you're there, leave a written review so more alums can listen in. I'm Greg Berry, a UAB alum and director of communications in the Office of Alumni Affairs. For most MDs, they spend their careers trying to do their best to keep their patients healthy or make them better. That's not the case for Dr. Gregory Davis. You see, Dr. Davis is actually diagnosing death as the chief coroner and medical examiner for Jefferson County, Alabama. I'm not trying to save someone's life. Instead, I'm doing what's interesting to me, which is to start at the end and work my way backwards to try to figure out how we got here. Over the course of his career, Dr. Davis has seen plenty of death, and as he'll share, he and his peers need to approach their careers differently than the vast majority of us. They said, if, if you grieve like you've lost your mother or, or a, a child, they said, then you, you'll have to get out of the, the business because you can't, you, can't, you can't grieve like that. And we'll discover how different corners think about things, even something as simple as watching movies. This is an animated film, but the thing I thought the instant that that happened was at least one person just died and somebody's got to examine that body and take care of it. Every day, Dr. Gregory Davis is surrounded by patients who can't verbally answer his questions, but that's not to say he doesn't get answers. As chief coroner and medical examiner, he gets plenty of them through the many autopsies he performs each year. Dr. Davis has made UAB home for the past three decades after being recruited to join the Department of Pathology. And for him, he's always had an interest in science, even as a kid going to see the doctor. I always thought, this is really amazing. This is interesting that, that this person can do all these things and figure out what's what's right, you know, well, usually they were well checkups for school, but, or if I were sick, figure it out. So I always found that interesting, even though I didn't like getting shots or anything like that, of course. At what point did you think, you know what, maybe I can make a career out of this, you know, science, medicine, things like that? Well, it was always put forward to me as a a career. My father was a chemist and uh, worked for DuPont there in the Nashville area. And so I always thought of, of science and chemistry as something that was important and, and well worth doing. Uh, medicine seemed like a, a attractive possibility to me too. My mother thought that was a good idea. She was particularly interested in my becoming a physician, but I liked the sounds of it too. I went on to, to college and I, I got the grades and, and got the scores necessary to get into medical school. So um, I was a chemistry major as my father was before me, as a backup plan in case I didn't get into medical school, but I did. And so, uh, so that worked out well. As we look at things today, not only do you serve as a director of the forensic division of the department of pathology here at UAB, you're also the chief coroner and medical examiner for Jefferson County. Yes. When did your career shift to those things? During residency in pathology, I, I chose pathology because I liked the laboratory aspect of medicine. I like chemistry, so I, I liked that. Then when I'm in pathology and training in that, I've realized that what I most enjoy doing was, was performing autopsies. That may sound odd, but there's several reasons why I like it. I like working with my hands. Uh, so, so I like anatomy, so I'm able to, to do those things. I'm not trying to save someone's life. Instead, I'm doing what's interesting to me, which is to start at the end and work my way backwards to try to figure out how we got here. So, so various aspects of my personality are well suited for being a, a forensic pathologist. I didn't really realize that a priori. I thought that before I was actually exposed to it, I thought I would have nightmares. I had already figured out that if I wanted to to practice pathology for a living, I'd have to be a forensic pathologist, but I thought it would be too disturbing. The death part didn't bother me so much. As it happens, my father's father was a funeral director. So I had always grown up knowing that people die. 
And th that's unfortunate, of course. Um, but I never thought of, of death or being at a place where death was part of the atmosphere of the building, you know, my grandfather's funeral home. I never thought of that as an odd or disturbing place to be. Uh, to me, growing up, a funeral home is a place where you go and your grandfather knows how to jimmy the Coke machine and get you a free Coke. <laughs> or, see, it was free for me anyway. So no, none of any of that ever disturbed me. But I thought that, that some of the cases would, would be disturbing and some are disturbing. But when I finally had to, to spend a month performing forensic pathology as part of my training, in the first week, I realized, oh, this is everything that appeals to me. I, and I haven't had any nightmares. I saw some horrific things that first week even, but I didn't have any nightmares. And I thought, I can do this. So I pursued it. I had already agreed to take a, a training, a year of training in hematopathology, which would be leukemia and lymphoma sorts of pathology, which I enjoyed, but this was better. And so as soon as I discovered that, I started looking into where programs were. My wife and I, uh, by this time I was married, so Sue is my wife. She and I were trying to figure out where it would be a good place to go and train. And San Diego had a new program. It was pretty exciting, I thought. And San Diego is a fun place to live. When you started to tell your friends or when you're out and about and you're explaining what you do, what kind of looks do you get when you say, hey, you know what, I'm a medical examiner? Uh, well, that usually leads to confusion because nobody really knows exactly what that means. So so I, I usually would, would say I'm a coroner or a forensic pathologist. I think of myself as a forensic pathologist. But it depends on the crowd that you're with. Sure. Uh, I, if, if I sense that this is probably not a card, I, I usually don't lead with it anyway. It's just it's just odd. I just if, if people ask and they don't know, I'll just say I'm in medicine or pathology. As I've gotten older, I've gotten more comfortable with it, too. And, and it's just this is who I am. So if you if if this is a problem for you, then then maybe we better figure that out. But uh, so so now I, I usually just say I'm a forensic pathologist, but I'll try to be very matter of fact about it and um, and not gravitate to the more uh, sensational aspects of it as a job. Most people don't realize they think of, of homicides and murder and all of that. And certainly that's a part of our job, but that's a actually I'm happy to report a tiny fraction of our job. Um, we're supposed to investigate sudden and unexpected deaths that occur here in Jefferson County. And still the most common cause of sudden and unexpected deaths out of all of the cases that we have is, is unrecognized heart disease. It, 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 people just don't think about it because that doesn't get in the news. Yeah. But, but that I, I'm doing that sort of thing all the time. There's a very strong public health component to the work that we do. Death certificates are created by and used by public health departments to try to figure out, if you wish, keep their finger on the pulse of the community's health. And one way to do that is by figuring out what it is that's, that causes people to die. We all must die, but we don't necessarily have to do it uh, when we're young. If we can avoid things that can end life too soon, like drug use or reckless driving or driving while intoxicated, then we can have a longer life and, and not only enjoy our life ourselves, but enjoy it as part of a community so that we are contributing to the betterment of the community. That's why it's public health. We're, we're interested in promoting good health for the good of the community. You mentioned that your job is to kind of work backwards. You know, you have a body and then you have to try to figure out how that person passed away. I'm sure at sometimes you see somebody and you go, okay, I got a good idea of what this is, but is it a process? Do you have to kind of do a, a checkbox and say, okay, I'm ruling this out now. I'm ruling this out now. Okay. It could be this. How is that process? It is. Well, it's a, it's medicine. And so it's the same sort of process that, that any physician would use when you go see a physician. The first part of, of medical investigation is history. So with a patient, you ask the patient, what brings you here today? And, and the answer may be, well, I, I, um, I hadn't seen a doctor in five years and I'm trying to get life insurance or something. They said, I've got to get a checkup. Well, that, that's a fine reason. 
that'll get you one sort of, of evaluation. But you may instead say, well, I've been having this really bad chest pain and, and it, it's, it's, it's worrying me. Well, now it's worrying me too as a physician. So you'll get a different sort of evaluation, a different sort of attention. It's not that, that we don't we care more about one person than another person. It's that different circumstances call for different sorts of, of responses. So I have that too, but we can't, of course, ask questions of someone who's died, but we find out information in part from the scene. If, if there's been a car wreck, well, then that, that tells you a lot about what it is that may have caused that person to die. Or if, if somebody's, uh, there were gunshots and then there, there's a body in an alley somewhere, then you've got a pretty good idea of where you may be going with that. But um, there's also history. So a family might say, for example, well, you know, um, he, he had high blood pressure, but he, he didn't he didn't really like to worry about. It. He said he'll just he'll just live his life carefully and, and watch what he eats and he'll be OK. And that may work up to a point. But at, at some point, if you have untreated high blood pressure, it adversely affects your heart and you can end up dying from it after after some years. So so those are all bits of history that I get through. We have an investigative team in our office. Uh, and, and so those investigators gather history, the circumstances surrounding death, and then any medical information that the family may know. So I consider that. And then, as you say, I form a, a, my checklist, or, or in medicine, we call it a differential diagnosis, of these are the sorts of things that I think could explain this death and you just work your way down the list and, and figure out what it is. The examination of the body part is uh, usually an autopsy where I look inside. And so then I may see exactly what I expect. Most of the time that's the case because history is very powerful. Uh, but there's physical findings too. And that's how you corroborate your impressions from the history. So the history and the physical examination together along with any laboratory studies you perform. If all of those things are pointing you to the same diagnosis, then you can be pretty confident that that's the correct diagnosis. Over the course of your 30 year career, I'm sure you have done thousands of autopsies. In a typical week, typical month, how many are you performing? How many are your is your team performing? Our office averages about four uh, deaths per day that we investigate and about three uh, about 75 percent of the bodies that we examine end up uh, getting autopsy it's a choice that we are, are uh, empowered to make by the law that created and governs our office so we the pathologists decide whether an autopsy is necessary or not at what point do you say you know what one is needed Different things can, can lead to that. Okay. Uh, I'll start with an obvious example, a homicide. It may be abundantly clear why someone's died if they've been shot many times. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, you perform an autopsy. You're recovering bullets that may be evidence. Um, you're just making sure that there's nothing else that might explain the death. And while that may seem almost comical, uh, I can actually now say that Years ago, I had a case where a body was found. Uh, it was mostly skeletonized. The body had been wrapped in a, uh, a rug and, and put down in a, a ravine. And the person had been shot in the head. I could tell that even though it was a skeleton because of, of the appearance of a hole uh, in, the, in the head, in the skull. But when I got to court, uh, the defense attorney suggested that this person might have died of a heart attack because I didn't even look at the heart is, is how the attorney worded it. So my response was, well, I, I think I should clarify that I didn't look at the heart because the heart had decomposed while this person was wrapped up in a rug in a ravine. And while it's true, I suppose, technically, that the person could have had a heart attack, that would be to ignore the presence of a bullet hole in the skull. And, and I can't ignore that. I think that's a very important factor. So important that I consider that the cause of death, this gunshot wound in the head. While it may sound almost comical, uh, that's a part of why we autopsy all homicides to make sure that we're not missing anything. If people ask, I can say, I looked, I consider that, I looked. 
another case where you would perform an autopsy would be if you just don't really know what happened. We're supposed to figure out why people died. So I mentioned earlier, someone might have untreated heart disease. So maybe a person's uh, 50 years old, that seems uh, too young to just cavalierly say, ah, it was his heart, that's the way it goes. And just, just dies, say at work unexpectedly. It's a big deal. People are concerned, they're upset. And we can figure out what happened. That may be cold comfort, but it is, in fact, a sort of comfort to be able to tell a, a family, this is this is what happened. I know you didn't expect it. This is what happened. It, it may have ramifications for the family. It, it may not. But knowing what happened uh, helps people begin to try to process it. It would be part of, of the process of grieving is trying to understand why did did my loved one die now? I'm not always able to figure it out. About two or three percent of our cases, we can't find a cause of death. People are complicated. Bodies are complicated. But I can tell you that when I don't figure out the cause of death, it's very frustrating for families. They do not want to be told that we can't figure out why someone died. With so many years in forensics in pathology how has the industry changed obviously technology has over the years but what else have you seen modify itself throughout the time when i first got into this business 30 years ago <clears throat> the generation ahead of me had a few females but but not that many they were they were stern hard women i can tell you very good too but uh, they had to be tough to to make it i think but now there are many women in in forensic pathology, and I'm glad I'm glad of it. I think it's it's brought uh, one aspect of forensic pathology that people don't really think about, or, or I hear people say, "Well, if you deal with dead people, you don't have to interact with them," and and all all that, and, and it shows an, an, a, just a misunderstanding of how much interacting we do with the relatives of those people who have died. We interact with people all the time, and I'm absolutely certain that you can't be an effective forensic pathologist if you don't understand the society in which you live. You have to be an integral part of the society because some aspects of death are caught up in, in the, the way people live their lives and, and society. So having different perspectives from, you know, male perspectives, female perspectives, people that are born in the U.S., people that have immigrated to the U.S., seeing all these different perspectives and having them be part of the death investigation community in the nation makes for better death investigation, better understanding. What makes a good forensic scientist? Caring. You have to care. You, and the people who practice forensic pathology, you asked what had changed about forensic pathology. Uh, one thing that's starting to change are the salaries. It, it's it's uh, it, because most jobs in forensic pathology are civil service jobs in county or state government agencies. The salaries haven't always been that high. What that meant I'm not. I'm not complaining. Um, I'm grateful to the, the for the salary that I have. I'm just telling you that there are other aspects of medicine that a physician could practice that would make more money than forensic pathology. Now, I actually perceive that that has been a benefit to forensic pathology in a perverse way, which is it made sure that the people who went into forensic pathology did it because they really passionately wanted to do this work. It's not because the money attracted me. It's because the work attracted me. And as long as we keep that sort of, of passionate commitment to this specific sort of job, we'll be in good shape. I had a class I took as a medical student called Death and Dying. It was an elective. It was taught by two, two oncologists. And it turned out to be the single most important class I took for teaching me how to deal with my job that I have now. But what they taught me was you, you have to learn in medicine, you have to learn how to care and care deeply, but without letting 
it destroy you when you lose a patient. But they were in oncology, so certainly they did have patients who died of cancer. And they said, if, if you grieve like you've lost your mother or, or a, a child, they said, then you, you'll have to get out of the, the business because you can't, you, can't, you can't grieve like that but a few times in your life. We suggest you save it for when you really need it and not use it on one of your patients. Save it for a spouse or, or some, someone like that. But, but, but you need to, to care and care deeply about trying to figure out why people died and then transmit that information in a caring way to whomever you talk to, whether it's, it's family or uh, attorneys in court or, or detectives, whomever. So if you wonder what it's like to live inside the head of a forensic pathologist, I can tell you about mine, but I don't, I don't go see violent movies anymore. I haven't done it in years and years and years. I, 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 I see all that at work, or the, at least the effects of it. I don't want to see, it's not entertaining to me to see violence. And the best way I know to describe that is when I saw the movie, The Incredibles, a wonderful movie. I've, I've seen it several times. I enjoy it every time. But if you might remember, there's a part, it's one of the funniest scenes in the movie when Frozone is trying to find his super suit. And he's, he's, he's telling his wife, where's my super suit? And she's you know, saying, you know, why, what, are you, what are you all upset about? And he's talking about the greater good. And she says, I'm the greatest good you're ever going to know. And it's, it's, it's hilariously funny. But to emphasize what's going on, this is an animated film. At one point, while he's in the window behind him, this helicopter goes down and then this huge fireball comes up. This is an animated film. But the thing I thought the instant that that happened was at least one person just died and somebody's got to examine that body and take care of it. That was automatic. That's how I think. On 9-11, when the planes had flown into the, the Twin Towers, when I saw it, the first thing I thought, besides, oh my goodness, this is terrible, is Dr. Charles Hirsch, who was the chief medical examiner for New York City at the time, and his colleagues are going to have all this work that they must do. And so I prayed, I prayed for them. And, and, and I pray for the families too and all that, but the people that care for people who've already dead need, need prayers as well because it, it's it's a important job, it's a rewarding job, it's a fulfilling job. I'm glad I have it, but it's a hard job too. With your line of work, how do you decompress? Every forensic pathologist that I know has some thing that isn't forensic pathology that's really important to that person. In my case, you know, for many, it's family, of course. And then uh, my wife and I like to exercise together, run or, or cycle or walk or hike, what have you. Um, I like to bake. I'm a, I've been an avid bread baker since I was a teenager. So uh, I, I do that sort of thing. But it's finding, it's finding little things that make life special and important to you and then making sure that you take the time for those little things. That's really important. There's one other essential component, which I have noticed. I've never yet met someone who is in forensic practice who doesn't have a dark sense of humor. I think that's, I, I've, I've decided that's necessary. If you do not have that capacity, I don't think you could stay in the job. I, I think you would just run screaming out the door. But but that seems to be an essential psychological need if you're going to stay in this business. That's Dr. Gregory Davis. In 2001, Dr. Davis was awarded his Master of Science in Public Health from the School of Public Health at UAB. Not only does he serve as professor and director of the Forensic Division of the Department of Pathology, but Dr. Davis is also chief coroner and medical examiner of Jefferson County, Alabama. As a longtime member of the UAB community, Dr. Davis has a great idea of what it means to be a blazer. What really impressed me about UAB when I got here 
and it continues to be true, is that UAB it, it has many good accomplishments, excellent accomplishments. I suppose they could be tempted to sit on their laurels and, and brag about how great they've done. But I don't see UAB doing that. I see UAB remaining hungry, remaining convinced that they need to work and try and aspire to greatness, not congratulate themselves because they've achieved greatness. And it's that aspiration to do the best that we can possibly do that makes me glad to be one of the Blazers. Be sure to check out past episodes of the UAB Green and Told podcast. Listen in at alumni.uab.edu slash green and told. Have a story to share or know someone who does? Email green and told at uab.edu. Finally, be sure to follow us on social media. Just search UAB alumni on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks for listening. And until next time, go Blazers.